Well, just a couple things before I get started. First of all, um, that announcement lady was awesome. <laughs> Secondly, Psalm 150 says we are to praise the Lord with trumpet, harp, and lyre. And we've done that today, only we added uh, fiddle and banjo and harmonica and accordion and bass and all that stuff. So thank you guys so much, and ladies, for that uh, leading us in worship today. A lot of fun. Well, how many of you have at least heard of the Broadway hit musical called Hamilton? Oh, of course, everybody's heard of it. How many of you have been lucky enough to actually see a show, Hamilton? Yeah, a lot of high fives going on. People have had a chance to do that. Well, it's become something of a cultural phenomenon since it opened in 2015. Sells out months and weeks in advance. Um, set an all-time record back at Christmas time in one week on Broadway. Eight days made over four million dollars, with the average ticket price being 353 dollars and a top price over 1,100 dollars for one seat. Amazing. Now, the musical, as many of you know, tells the somewhat revised story of Alexander Hamilton. Now, most of us are familiar with Hamilton because his face is on the picture of the $10 bill, has been since 1928. Some of you have that him right in your pocket right now. But the show revolves around his bitter relationship with his political rival named Aaron Burr. He looks like a happy fellow. <laughs> Would you like to hang out with him for a while? Well, this past Wednesday, did you know, on July 11th was the 214th anniversary of one of the most infamous events in American history, the tragic duel between Hamilton and Burr that resulted in Hamilton's death. This is a famous engraving of that moment. Now, here's the story in just a nutshell. Both Burr and Hamilton were highly intelligent, accomplished men of great personal ambition and political power. Burr, in fact, was the sitting vice president of the United States under Thomas Jefferson, and Hamilton had been the first secretary of the Treasury under George Washington, but they were bitter political enemies. Hamilton despised Burr and campaigned against him loudly in a number of campaigns, and Burr believed Hamilton had cost him a chance to become governor of New York, and so he challenged Hamilton to what at that time was called an affair of honor, a gentlemanly phrase for a duel with guns. Now, affairs of honor were quite common at the time. They had not yet become illegal in this country. Hamilton himself had been involved in up to 10 of these affairs of honor in his lifetime. Uh, but none of them had resulted in anyone getting shot. Most often at a duel, the parties would take their 10 steps, then one or the other would shoot their fit pistol into the ground, indicated there's another way we can do this thing, and so that's how they would resolve the conflict, but not this time. On July 11th, 1804, the two men and their assistants met at 7 a.m. on the dueling grounds near Weehawken, New Jersey. Ironically, the very same spot where three years earlier, Hamilton's 19-year-old son, Philip, had died in a duel defending his father's honor. Now, to this day, there are differing accounts about what happened. According to Hamilton's people, Hamilton decided not to fire at his enemy, but fired up over his head intentionally, indicating his desire to resolve it some other way. However, Burr's people think he fired at Burr, but just missed. And so everybody agrees what happened next is Burr fired and hit Hamilton, giving him a mortal wound. He died uh, the next afternoon. Now, while the story is tragic, I think we would all agree that solving an interpersonal conflict with a duel, with guns, is not the wisest thing in the world. In fact, it's probably extraordinarily foolish. And yet Burr and Hamilton were bright, accomplished men. So how does that happen? Now, we're today continuing our summer series from James called Street Level Faith. And to this point, James uh, has been greatly concerned uh, to confront what he sees as a disconnect between how these early Christians, followers of Jesus, were living as opposed to what they said they believed about the gospel. Last week, we talked about the power of words, how words can set on fire, how words can poison. And today, James teaches us about two kinds of wisdom. So let me read for you from James chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. James says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Let me pause there for a moment. We remember back in chapter 1, we'll go to this later this morning, uh, James has already urged his readers to ask God for wisdom. And he's been warning about the destructive power of the tongue. His theme throughout the entire letter is that what we believe should impact what we do or how we live. Verse 14, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. 
For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is the first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Okay, the first thing James talks about here is the person of wisdom. What does a person of wisdom look like? I've said many times before, told you I graduated from college, at least the first time, uh, because I went several times, uh, in 1978. I studied at Davison College, which is located in a little southern town, at that time, tiny little town in North Carolina. Uh, Stoplight, a barbershop, a 7-Eleven, a couple of gas stations, that's about it. But the town also had this ancient-looking, rickety water tower just a block or two from campus. Um, It was surrounded by a chain link fence, all kinds of signs saying danger, 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 stay out, no trespassing and all that, which made it something of a tradition for college students to try to climb the water tower. Well, toward the end of my senior year, uh, my little friendship group uh, realized we were hanging out one night and none of us had ever climbed the water tower, so one thing led to another and they decided that would be a good night to climb the tower before we all graduated. Kind of group think, so we all headed to the tower. Now, before I tell the rest of the story, you need to know that Uh, I I have never been very fond of heights. I just don't like, I don't like being high in the air. I don't like, never like roller coasters very much. I don't really even like going on Ferris wheels. I don't really even like climbing on ladders. Anything that makes me feel like I'm going to die, I don't don't like very much. And that was true back in 1978. But still, I went with the group to the water tower. Everything in me said, this is a bad idea. But I started up this, this rusty metal ladder that was actually loose enough to bang it against the the strut on which it was uh, uh, attached. Not a good idea. Um, And everything in me wanted not to do it, but I I did. I got about halfway up this ladder. It was about a 100-foot high water tower. And I suddenly had an epiphany, like a come-to-Jesus moment. There were people ahead of me on the ladder, people behind me on the ladder, and I realized um, I couldn't turn around. I couldn't go back. I didn't want to go any farther up. I was stuck. And I began, to, uh, I began to pray one of those desperate foxhole type, water tower ladder type prayers. You know what they're like. If, if, if you can just get me down from here, I'll never, ever do anything this dumb again. Well, somehow I was able to make it all the way up to the top, all the way down. But the next day I woke up and my shins were sore. I looked down and I had these big bruises on my legs. I mean, big, ugly bruises. And I realized I had been so scared my legs were shaking hard enough against the metal ladder to actually create bruises that lasted for several weeks. Now, how, how and why would an otherwise intelligent and cautious person do such a foolish thing? Was it peer pressure? Check. Uh, desire to be liked, included? Check. Fear of being seen as weak or afraid? Check. James says here, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So what is wisdom anyway? The word James uses here is the Greek word sophia, from which we get our word philosophy. But it means more than intelligence, more than knowledge. It carries the sense of understanding, which is why it's possible for really smart people to do really dumb things. A wise person is someone who understands how to apply knowledge to life in a way that produces good outcomes. Hamilton and Burr were both intelligent and knowledgeable men, but they did not display wisdom. I was reasonably intelligent as a college student, a little bit lazy in my studies, but displayed a profound lack of wisdom climbing up that water tower. Now, how do we recognize wisdom? How do we know a person who has wisdom? James says, by his good conduct, let him show his good works, his works in the meekness of wisdom. We can identify wisdom in two ways. First, good conduct. If Hamilton had said, well, you know, Mr. Burr, I think there's a better way for us to resolve our differences. That would have displayed good conduct, wisdom. If I would have had the courage to say, hey guys, you know, I don't think this is a great idea. Somebody could get seriously hurt. It's dark. The thing is, who knows how uh, uh, rickety the ladder is. I think there's a better thing to do tonight. That would have demonstrated wisdom by good conduct. Secondly, he says, in the meekness of wisdom. Now, the English word meekness is easily misunderstood by us today. We tend to hear weakness or someone who's timid or withdrawn, but that's not what James means. The Greek word uh, means gentle strength or a power that's under control. 
So back to the water tower. It was actually weakness that led me to follow along with the crowd and do something I knew that wasn't very smart. It would have taken the kind of strength of conviction to step out of groupthink and speak wisdom into that situation. James says that's the meekness of wisdom. So that's what a wise person looks like. Good conduct, meekness, and wisdom. But where does wisdom come from? That leads us to the second point today, what James calls wisdom from below. Wisdom from below. How many of you remember the story of a woman named Wanda Holloway? Anybody ring a bell? Okay, let me tell you her story. She was the mom who back in 19, you can leave it on the screen. She was the mom back in 1991 who had a 14-year-old daughter, middle school daughter, who had failed to make the junior high cheerleading squad. She was so desperate for her daughter to be on that squad that she devised a plan. She planned to, to she attempted actually to hire a hitman to kill the mother of the girl that got the final spot, thinking that that trauma would cause that girl to withdraw from the team, allowing her, girl, her, her daughter to take the last spot. True story. You can look it up. She was eventually arrested for solicitation of murder and sentenced to 15 years in prison. Now we think, how in the world could someone think that was a good idea? How does that happen? James explains it right here. He says in verse 14, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. So he's talking about wisdom, and he's comparing two kinds of wisdom. He says there's wisdom that comes down from above. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And he talks about wisdom that is not from above or wisdom that's from below. He's talking about a wisdom that is not really wisdom at all. It's what Proverbs means in Proverbs 14 when it says, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end leads to death. For example, let's settle our issues with an affair of honor. Shoot guns at each other. Or, if I want my daughter to be on the cheer squad. If I can just, if I can just find a way to kill her mother and get her out. <laughs> There's a way that appears to be right, but in the end leads to death. So what does earthly wisdom look like? He says, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. The phrase bitter jealousy comes from two Greek words, one that means sharp, uh, accurate, or malignant, and the other means passion, zealousness. In this context, you put them together, it means a malignant kind of passion to get what someone else has. It's envy. The phrase selfish ambition comes from just one Greek word that comes out of the political world. It means to seek political office by unfair means, someone willing to do whatever it takes to get what they want. Isn't it interesting that these words are written 2,000 years ago in a much different culture and time, but they read just as relevant today? Selfish ambition, bitter jealousy. Bitter jealousy and selfish ambition are what drove Hamilton and Burr to what they did, what drove Wanda Holloway to do what she did, and sometimes they are the forces that drive us. We want what we don't have. We want what someone else have, whether it be status or authority or position or acceptance or wealth. Question, why does James feel it necessary to address this issue? What may have been happening among the early Christians at that time. He's already talked about issues like partiality, that is, treating people differently according to their wealth. He says this should not be so. He's already talked about the danger of the tongue to use destructive words to, to kill relationships and to injure others. He's implied that not all should be teachers, that teachers should be humble. So maybe we can guess that there were some who were teaching and leading out of jealousy and selfish ambition. James says bitter jealousy and selfish ambition produce boasting and lies, falsehood. Maybe exaggerating their own resumes. Every now and then we read stories about someone who has fudged a resume to appear to be something they are not. Maybe that was going on among the teachers. Maybe making claims that were untrue. You know, I knew Jesus too. I walked with him too, when they really didn't. 
Or maybe they were teaching a perverted form of the gospel that was damaging people uh, in their faith. We don't know exactly. But clearly something was going on. Where does this version of wisdom come from? What's the source? Well, James uses three words. He says this kind of wisdom is earthly. That means it comes from how the world thinks. This is a dog-eat-dog world. Look out for number one. You got to protect yourself. Wisdom driven by selfish ambition, pride, greed, all those things we see around us. Proverbs chapter 9 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So God, according to the Bible, is the source of all true wisdom. And anything else is earthly wisdom. Secondly, he says it's unspiritual This means it does not come from the Holy Spirit that has been promised to every believer. It means this is wisdom that doesn't come from God. It comes from somewhere else. And the third word he uses is demonic. Now that's a powerful word that gets our attention. Here James is not talking about the kind of demonic possession we see in horror movies, but rather thinking and behavior built on lies and falsehoods that simply do not come from God, that are opposed to God. Paul talks about this kind of wisdom in Colossians chapter 2 when he writes, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. There's a difference. James then moves on to the results of earthly wisdom. He says, and remember, the theme of this whole letter is that what we do bears witness to what we believe. What we believe should shape what we do. He says, earthly wisdom, that is wisdom, thinking, philosophy, that's driven by jealousy, ambition, and boasting, brings two things, disorder and vile practice. Disorder means confusion, instability, vile practice is that which is worthless and evil can happen between individuals, what happened between Hamilton and Burr over 200 years ago, can happen between groups. Think of the political climate in our nation today. Can happen between nations, can happen in marriages and in family, and it can happen in the church. But James says there is another way. There is another kind of wisdom that leads to the third thing today, and that is wisdom from above. Look what he says in verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So what does he mean by wisdom from above? Remember back in chapter 1, read this a little bit earlier, James urged us to, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. He's talking about wisdom from God. Now, I think it's important here to talk just a moment about how God imparts wisdom to us. Is it sort of magical? How does God impart to us his wisdom? I think there are at least four ways. First, God imparts wisdom through trials and prayer. Trials and prayer. James 1 says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. James is teaching us here, I think, that trials Plus, prayer brings maturity and wisdom. Let me say that again. Trials, that's hard things, painful situations, plus prayer produces wisdom and maturity. If you think about it, you don't really need wisdom when times are good, when the sailing is smooth. What you, when you need wisdom is when the storm comes when life is difficult and painful. And that's when God promises that if we ask, he will grant us his wisdom from above through the Holy Spirit. So first, through trials and prayer. Secondly, through the teaching and example of Jesus himself. These early believers did not have the New Testament in their hands the way we do today. And we have a great privilege having the entire New Testament. 
This is only 10 or 15 years after the resurrection of Jesus. So they had the teachings of Jesus, particularly in the Sermon on Mount, to go on. And in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, this is at the end of the Sermon on the Mount where he talks about what kingdom living looks like. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the meek. Tells us how to live when we're angry, how to follow God, how to obey, how to live holy lives. He says, those who listen to these words of mine and put them into practice are like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Wisdom comes to us through the teaching of Jesus. Thirdly, God imparts wisdom through his word. In Psalm 119, we read, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. What we believe impacts how we live. Psalm 119, verse 35, direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statues and do not, not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Again, Verse 105, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light for my path. Do we take delight in God's word because it leads us on the path to wise and healthy living? And then fourth, God imparts his wisdom through spiritual leaders, through mature believers who can offer wise counsel, men like James, who's doing exactly that with these people that he cares about. Do you have wise and godly counselors in your life that can help share wisdom with you? And then he goes on to tell us that this wisdom from above, this wisdom from God, looks like, and then he gives us eight descriptive words to describe God's wisdom. Let me go through them quickly. First, pure. This wisdom is pure. The word he uses for pure is the root word for holy. That is unstained by selfish ambition, unstained by by ambition, unstained by jealousy, uncontaminated, like water from an uncontaminated source. It's pure. It's peaceable. That is not given to conflict. The gospel leads us into peace with God. And when we have peace with God, we can live in peace with other people. It's peaceable. There are these open to reason. Exactly what Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Burr lacked a couple of hundred years ago. It's full of mercy. So this gentle, again, this word gentle, I, I kind of went back there, gentle doesn't mean weak. It means secure and strong enough to offer grace even when it's costly to do so. The whole world watched last week as the rescue in Thailand was going on. I can't even imagine the cost to get those boys and their coach out of that cave. Can't even imagine Yet there was no question, this is a cost we're willing to pay. That's what he means by the strength of grace, gentleness. Full of mercy, impartial and sincere. Impartial and sincere wisdom. You know, there's a great debate that's going to happen in our country in the next few weeks. It's already begun to start. It's already started. It's over the, the, vac the vacant spot on the Supreme Court. And the battle lines are already being drawn. And the whole debate is raging about politics, politics, politics. Well, what about wisdom that is impartial and sincere? What about that? Should that be something we consider in a Supreme Court judge? Finally, wisdom from above produces a harvest of righteousness. Wisdom from God always produces good fruit. You know it because it produces good things. Paul writes about this in Galatians when he says, but the fruit of the Spirit what the Spirit of God is trying to grow in all of us all the time is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's what it looks like, wisdom from above. In 1968, <clears throat> for those of you old enough to remember, or those who have studied American history, our country was coming apart at the seams, it seemed, 1968. Vietnam War was raging on. There were riots in our cities and riots on our college campuses. Martin Luther King Jr. and Bobby Kennedy were killed within two months of each other. Violence and anger were everywhere. I can remember, I was 12 years old. I remember watching the news at night. It was scary. It was a scary time. 
In that same year, in 1968, an unknown ordained Presbyterian minister who had become disenchanted by what he observed on television, particularly in television aimed at children, he launched a new vision. He created a different kind of TV show for kids, not 30 minutes filled with superficial and even violent cartoon images, not the constant bombardment of commercials that turns them into nothing but little tiny consuming machines. But he imagined a safe place for children where they would feel special and love, where their fears would be calm, where they would be encouraged to think and live wisely in a scary world. In 1968, with the wisdom of this world tearing it apart, a man named Fred Rogers launched a revolution in TV programming called Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. How many of you remember watching Mr. Rogers' as kids? Every show began with Mr. Rogers putting on his sweater. By the way, his mother knitted every sweater he wore. And he sang a song. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. A beautiful day for a neighbor. I would sing it now and you would sing it with me. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Would you be my neighbor? Now some made fun of what they saw as his naive simplicity. Some mocked him for his relentless niceness. But for over 30 years and 895 episodes, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood taught and modeled kindness, patience, understanding, and love in ways that shaped close to two generations of American children. Now, I would make an argument that what he offered was a wisdom that was pure, peaceable, gentle, impartial, and sincere. What he offered was a wisdom from above, not a wisdom from below. Closing thought. What are you facing right now in your life where you need wisdom? What are you facing right now where you need wisdom? Maybe a conflict in a relationship? James would say, don't look down. Look up. Maybe a career decision that impacts your family. James would say, don't look down. Look up. Maybe a financial decision, an issue. James would say, don't look for wisdom that comes from below. There's a lot of it. Look for wisdom that comes from above. Will you bow with me as I close? Lord, once again, thank you for your word, for this ancient letter of instruction and wisdom. We live in a world driven by selfish ambition, bitter jealousy, fear, pride, all those things. We know these things produce pain and conflict, but by your Spirit who lives in us, make us a people of your wisdom, people who are pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy. And through us, may you reap a harvest, a harvest of good fruit. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.